I thought that he was the prince then. I thought he was the heir apparent to President Kennedy, and I wish the hell that he could have made it. When I saw him in real life, it was a thrill to me, sir. But when I saw him there that night at the ambassador, he seemed like a, a saint. Every morning when I get up, sir, say, I wish that son of a gun were alive, because I wouldn't have to be here now. I started searching for coffee. That was all that I wanted to do. And I found some. But where, I don't remember, sir. I don't remember where I saw it. And uh, there was a girl there. No, 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 I don't remember much what, uh, what happened after that. Other than the choking and, uh, and the commotion. I don't remember that. I'm not mentally ill, sir, but I'm not perfect either. I, I was, I, obviously I was there. But uh, I don't remember the exact moment. I don't remember pulling my gun out of my body or whatever it was located and I don't remember aiming it at any human being. Uh -huh. I don't remember any of that. The reality of this whole thing hit me when I was on death row. Oh, oh yeah. I would say maybe maybe a, maybe a year, two years. I had a, a, a chance to speak with Dr. Weathers. At the time he was uh, the chief psychologist, for, a psychiatrist for the prison. And he, I mentioned to him about how, I, how badly, how horribly I feel about this Bobby Kennedy. Uh, thing and it's, it haunts me every day. I think about it. This is this whole thing was a it, it's a horrible nightmare, really, for not just for me, but for you people, for the whole country, and especially for the for the family members. Engage your brain and enter the mind's eye on Z Talk Radio. I'm your host Brian Turnov. You just heard the words from Saran Saran, the person who assassinated RFK and which we just sadly celebrated the anniversary a few weeks back. And the reason why I played that audio clip, and you'll hear a few throughout the night, is that they deal with mind control in Brainwash. You hear him talk about how he doesn't remember. Well, what are the reasons why he doesn't remember shooting RFK, probably our next president at the time? And who would be behind such horrific experiments? These are some of the questions that you'll find the answers to tonight. Mention this fact or utter the words mind control to someone, most people, and they'll tell you to, hey, put your tinfoil cap back on. Well, tonight it's time to take off your tinfoil caps and replace them with your thinking caps. Joining me in this discussion to show you the validity and the history of brainwashing is best-selling author Marie D. Jones. She's appeared on History Channel's Nostradamus Effect and Ancient Alien television series. We're here to talk about her latest, Mind Wars, a history of mind control, surveillance, and social engineering by the government, media, and secret societies. Links to Marie D. Jones' website and the book is up on ours, themindseyemedia.com. You can also check it out on our social media pages, Twitter.com backslash Minds Eye Show. Uh, again, the same deal with Facebook. Facebook.com backslash Minds Eye Show. Are we really in control of our own minds? We'll dig deep into this and find the answer on the other side of the break. Back into on Z Talk Radio's The Minds Eye. I'm your host, Brian Turnup, joined by guest Marie D. Jones on the other side of the break. Now joining us is Marie D. Jones, one half of the real X-Files team. Welcome to the Mind's Eye, Marie. Well, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure. Oh, I can't wait. You're, you're a ton of fun. And I have a feeling that the roles kind of might be a little reversed when it comes to X-Files. I see some Fox Mulder in you. Are, are you Fox or Scully? Who, who are you? I think I'm, <laughs> I'm a little bit of both. I think so. Well, aren't we I'm all? a believer and a skeptic. I'm a science, you know, science freak, but uh, I'm an open-minded one. So I would definitely say I'm probably both of them put together. Yeah, I, I think everybody has a little bit of each of them in you uh, individually, and I, I know I definitely do. But I, I probably tend to lean toward the fox side, Sally, and I'll admit it. I will be the first to admit it. Uh, <laughs> and you're, Marie, you're quite the prolific writer. I wouldn't be surprised if you've probably written over a million words in your lifetime, if not the, if not more than that. Oh, oh, I'm sure I have. <laughs> I've been writing since I was a kid, and I've been publishing since I was a teenager. So. If I ever sat down and tried to do my entire resume of writing, it would be impossible. 
it would be. I would probably have to take one whole show just going through the bio uh, in itself. So, I, uh, you know, <laughs> I probably wouldn't be able to remember half the stuff I did. Um, but yeah, it just you know, I was one of those weird people that always knew what I wanted to do. So. Well, God bless you, and, and for those still searching, hopefully one day we can we can be like you, Marie, and, and find our calling, because definitely is your calling, no doubt about that. And, uh, you're, yeah, you're, I don't know how to do anything else. <laughs> I always tell people I have to do this. <laughs> and you're here specifically to talk about your latest book, Mind Wars, and lots to discuss, a lot to chew on there, uh, not a lot of time to talk with, so let's get down to business and talk some shop here. Lay down the foundation for us and, and just really give us a, a quick synopsis of what the book is. Well, it really is a history of mind control, domestic surveillance, and social programming, and the way that uh, the government, the media, uh, secret societies over time, cults, the way that we have been manipulated to believe and act and uh, have certain behaviors, and it's not just the government, it's not just these big entities, it's the way we do it to each other. We're always at war with each other's minds and wanting to control each other's thoughts and behaviors, and of course that extrapolates to the, the bigger scale where we have our own government trying to get us to, to think a certain way, behave a certain way, act a certain way. And, and of course, now how we're constantly under surveillance by all of our electronic gadgets that we love so much. So the book really covers all of that. It's a really broad spectrum. And I think now more than ever, uh, people, and, and at least the general public, is ready to accept that brainwashing and mind control is pretty much a legitimate, real practice, uh, particularly sure. with the recent release of the, I guess it was the... Scientology documentary, and with all the documents being released oh, the Freedom of Information Act, so it definitely seems like it, it's gaining some credibility here. Uh, oh, absolutely. And we'll definitely get back to the call to action. Do you think, but before this, do you think essentially it was considered a, just a big old conspiracy? I think that's what people think in general, but no, absolutely not. I think there's conspiracy elements to this subject matter just as there is to anything else. And again, the word conspiracy really is not a bad word. It just means something that is done, you know, that's hidden. Or people that conspire to do something outside of the public eye. Um, I think that there are conspiracy elements to it, but a lot of what we wrote about the book is, it's right there, it's fact, it's, it's been proven, there's documentation, um, you know, it goes on all the time, it is, it's real. And I don't think people realize how rich a history we have of involving mind control all the way back to ancient times where we were using it via ritual and religious ritual, and now today we use it in different ways. Give us a, a few examples, uh, historically speaking, of the ancient civilizations and some of our ancient ancestors using mind control or, or forms of mind control. Well, if you go back to some of the god and goddess cults of ancient Egypt, ancient Rome, uh, really Babylonia, Sumeria, any ancient culture, there was so much emphasis on getting people to behave a certain way, and usually that meant the way that the gods and goddesses wanted them to, and also the way that the authority figures of the day wanted them to. And one of the ways that they did that was with rituals and rites. They did that with structured behavior, um, initiating people into to secret societies or initiating members into a religious, we call them religious cults, because that's basically what they were, and really laying down the law that you behaved a certain way, you believed certain things, and you followed this very strict order, this code of conduct, or you were kicked out, tortured, and maybe even killed. And certainly we saw that all the way through you know, the Middle Ages right down to today where we still have cults. And I consider organized religion to be cults. Politics, the media, you name it. So that, that behavior it seems to be just a part of our human nature to want to control each other. Yeah, I think people, you know, like we said before, when, when they hear brainwashing, mind control, they think of like a mindless zombie, essentially just at the whims of, uh, of their, of their pu you know, puppet and a puppeteer, so to speak. But really, after reading your book, I, I found that 
it's more of a spectrum and kind of a form of behavioral modification, more of just like a mindless zombie just being told what, what it is, and it really falls on a spectrum. Right. Uh, would, you, would you agree with that? It, it, it really, it's a large umbrella from what it seems like after reading your book. Oh, it is. I mean, it's everything from the very subtle type of mind control, which could be basically that every time you turn on the news, the news information that you're getting has been very specifically chosen by six, seven different corporate conglomerates that own all of the news media to kind of torture, to being locked up in, the, in a little room with no light, no food, no water until you change your behavior or adopt the mindset of your, of your captors or your abusers. And it's everything in between from hypnosis to um, behavior modification using positive and negative reinforcement uh, deprivation, drugs, it, it just really does, like you say, it runs the entire spectrum. And, you know, we also have to mention that a lot of these techniques we use on each other as individuals in a much, maybe a much smaller way, but they look at something like domestic violence. So a lot of the same mani manipulative techniques that the government used on prisoners and orphans and subjects during Project MK Ultra, which was our CIA's own mind control project, those same techniques are used between individuals, bosses and employees, you know, husbands and wives, um, domestic abusers and their victims. So it's all over the map how, how subtle this can be and how extreme it can be. Yeah, it happens. It happens on uh, small scales and large scales. Uh, and I want to talk about the societal mess uh, uh, form of brainwashing in a little bit. But you just brought up a uh, project MK Ultra. Uh, I want to talk about how the government uses mind control because obviously when they're using it, it, it is very dangerous. So let's 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 talk on that subject for a little bit. Uh, go into Project MK Ultra for our listeners who may not be familiar with it. Right. This is this is part of our history. It's not a yeah, conspiracy is, or a joke. You may have seen movies like uh, Conspiracy Theory with Mel Gibson that talk about MK Ultra, but this is the CIA ran a mind control program, a behavior modification program from the early 1950s to the mid 1970s before it was allegedly shut down after a couple of congressional and Senate hearings. Um, and this involved over 80 different institutions that were involved in, in these experiments. And this included orphanages, prisons, mental institutions, homes for unwed mothers, colleges, universities, pharmaceutical companies, you name it. And this is a very big, broad-reaching program. And basically the goal was the research and development of a number of different uh, methods of controlling human behavior, whether it was using chemicals, drugs, radiation, uh, biological materials, um, hypnosis, torture, sensory deprivation, mm, sexual abuse, torture. But here's the interesting thing about MK Ultra: that it was originally started as a way for us, the United States, to keep on top of and stay one step ahead of the brainwashing techniques that our POWs had experienced during the Korean War at the hands of the Chinese. So people could say, well, the origin of MK Ultra was sort of, I wouldn't say positive, because I don't think anything like this could be thought of as positive, but I think in the minds of the people involved, they thought they were doing a good thing. Yeah. But it just turned into this big, grand torture that people were abused. A lot of the um, subjects and victims came forth in lawsuits, and um, there has been some financial uh, recompense, but only in Canada, because one of the most notorious figures was a Canadian psychiatrist by the name of Donald Ewing Cameron. But here in the United States, what shut it down was the exposure at two different congressional hearings. And, and the unfortunate thing is that before it was exposed, uh, CIA Director Richard Helms ordered most of the files that were associated with MKL to destroy it. So we still have like 20,000 documents, yeah. which tells us a lot. 
But if you think about it, that means the vast majority of documents were destroyed. We have no idea what these people were up to. We yeah. have no idea except the living victims that came forth and were able to speak about it. We only know the the tip of the iceberg. So, uh, the and yeah. like, like you said before, this is a fact. Anyone can read about this through Freedom of Information Act documents. Absolutely. Uh, and so, yeah, just think, absolutely. and you have to think about. Well, they destroyed probably the worst ones that they can think of. So, really, the only ones that were shown are the minimal exactly. ones. So, it's it's really scary to wrap your head around that. And I'm hoping I'm not. I hope it's not that way. But uh, sadly. Uh, Knowing our country's history and our government's use, uh, it, it probably is that way. And uh, and the road to hell is, is paved to, to good intention. Uh, the road with the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That's what this with reminds me of quite. Yeah, frankly. and I and I agree with you. And I don't think MKUltra stopped. Now they, you know, obviously it was claimed that it was shut down, but I think it just morphed into a number of smaller programs that have existed since the seventies and still exist. And you know. There are experiments still being done in prisons. There are experiments still being done in mental institutions. We hear about them all the time. And we certainly don't know what's going on, you know, in these deep black programs. So it's not like MK Ultra died, it just changed form. And if we think about what was done then because of our fear of brainwashing by POWs, and you look at the threats that we're facing today with terrorism, you can only imagine the extent our government must be going through to continue to try to control. I mean, we've heard everything from psychic warfare to, you know, using um, sound waves and microwave harassment and these new directed energy weapons. And so none of this ended. Um, it, I just think that after this was exposed, the government got a lot more savvy about keeping it secret. Uh, is there and any, that's where the conspiracy element comes into play because now you know they're not going to they're not going to allow <laughs> people to find out as much uh, and have it shut down again. So. No, of course not. Everything I, I think they've learned their lessons by this point. Everything almost has to be in the private sector if you want to get something done that even has any yeah. uh, smell of anything unethical. Uh, in the, in the oh, absolutely. And there's plenty of private corporations that will gladly you know, take over this kind of work. I absolutely agree with you on that. And sadly, scientists, you know, like eugenicists who are part of this, uh, you know, they look at it, they look at these experiments almost like trying to make an omelet. you, you got to break a few eggs to, to, to get there. And uh, and there's been so many, like you said before, that, that, have, that have been sacrificed who we will never find out who were part of this experiment and, and, and never will. But there are a few that... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and there are a few, like you pointed out in the book, that we definitely do, or at least there are some pretty solid connections there. One, for example, is uh, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. Talk about the, the threads there, too. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Ultra. When he was a youngin, you know, he was he was a part of the MK Ultras um, when uh, at Harvard. Yeah, and it's really interesting. Also, uh, Whitey Bulger. There's a movie coming out where Johnny Depp is playing Whitey Bulger, the Irish mobster. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we found out that he volunteered during one of his prison sentences really? to be a part of an MK Ultra experiment involving an Alzheimer drug. Wow. And it just so freaked him out. I mean, we're talking about a hardcore criminal, and he was so freaked out that he, you know, begged to be taken out of the program. And that really was intriguing. And so I'm sure that there are probably a lot more people. That, uh, there's a lot of conspiracy theory involving shooter syndrome where you have assassins or attempted assassins um, that have you know, tried to take out presidents or shooters like the Aurora shooting, the Sandy Hook, etc. that they may be under this continued MK Ultra experimentation. You know, that they may be a part of whatever this morphed into. And it's intriguing because there's some really spooky, you know, circumstantial evidence to show that there may still be uh, the desire to create super assassins and super soldiers, and and that really was a big part of MK Ultra. And that's what really the government is looking for. So they are always looking for the perfect soldier, and that's really what what oh, brings yeah. down these these horrible 
terrible roads uh, that they keep leading themselves in. It really seems like a never-ending cycle of, of stupidity uh, around war, quite frankly. But uh, let, let's get back to the subject and uh, just go into a little bit more about the Ted Kaczynski, just so people really understand that the CIA and our own government, it, to me, it's almost like they're Dr. Frankenstein. What's, what's worse, is uh, the monster or is it Dr. Frankenstein who's unleashing these, these things on us? Uh, talk- I kind of, you know, I kind of think you got to blame the, the monsters. Um, I, I think people oh, are responsible well, no doubt about for that. Them, their own behavior on some level. But, well, with Ted Kaczynski, I mean, he was really young. It was, uh, this happened during 1959 at Harvard University. I'm trying to find his age. I think he was, gosh, early 20s. Yeah, I th- yeah, somewhere around there. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, was he, he 18, was, wasn't he? He was, he was 16. He was 16. a teenager. Impressionable, it was and, the most and, formative. <laughs> yeah, totally impressionable. You know, and I think what they do is they look for people that have sort of loner tendencies. Um, you know that because they can really prey on those. But he was part of an extreme uh, stress abuse behavior modification test at the hands of Henry Murray, who was a professor there at Harvard, and apparently. It involved some really heavy-duty uh, abuse in the form of mainly verbal abuse. Ego, you know, just decimating the ego and then just leaving them, leaving the young, these young kids feeling crippled emotionally and psychologically crippled. So then years later, <laughs> you have somebody like Kaczynski morph into the Unabomber, and a lot of his behavior has, you know, over time people have said it sounds to me like you know, he, he is not really clinically mentally ill, he's an intellectual, but there's just something wrong with him. And a lot of that could go back to the type of experimentation that he was exposed to. Now, does that mean that he's not guilty? No, of course, he's of course guilty not. for what he did. But I do think that there is um, a lot of responsibility on behalf of these torturers and abusers. I, I have such, you know... It, for, let's say, for example, someone who commits domestic abuse or domestic violence, and you find out later that they were victims of the same thing, you know, you still have to blame that person for what they did, well, but question. you also see that that was a, a pattern that they were repeating, that they had been exposed to when they were young and impressionable. Yeah, I, I, obviously you got to you got to put the blame where it is, and everybody's got to answer for their own sins. But the government has to answer right. for their own just just as much as this, we as individuals do, in my opinion. There has oh, to be some accountability. Case, definitely, I think anybody yeah who was put through this program, I think when they can destroy your mind enough and change your brain enough, they're literally changing the structure of your brain, your brain chemicals. They're also reprogramming your subconscious yeah. to believe things about yourself that may or may not be true, and they're changing people's identities with this kind of research. So, are you still responsible for your action? In a sense, you are, but if if you've been exposed to this kind of extreme abuse, I don't know how much you're really thinking clearly, and, and how much of that is the programming that was put back into you and reinforced through this experimentation. There's a there's a lot of gray areas in the, in this topic, in, in, unfortunately, in, in this aspect, and and we know it's serious. Today, scientists take mind control very serious. And, and before you're talking about how how their brain say that they do brainwash, but what's the actual process uh, of brainwashing and mind control like? Is it oh, a system? Gosh. Is it an art? What, you know, what exactly is it? It's, it's it's again, it's stuff that we use on each other to some degree. Uh, it, you know, some of the way, and cults, I think cults are the most wonderful example of this kind of manipulative technique in action. So it can involve everything from the use of positive, negative, and intermittent reinforcement, which is very powerful. The idea that you first give someone positive reinforcement, oh, we love you, you're a part of our family, oh, you're so important, and then you start intermingling negative reinforcement, which could be abuse, torture, or just verbal abuse. What happens to the brain is the brain starts operating on the increase in, say, dopamine or cortisol when it gets that positive reinforcement 
to the point where it, you begin to accept abuse just so you can grab onto the few crumbs of positive reinforcement that you know are coming. And you almost go numb. It's almost as if half of your identity goes numb. That is one of the most powerful forms of uh, coercive persuasion, using rhetoric, using language, preying upon a person's identity. Um, say someone is racist. Well, if you want to get them to join your cult, you can prey on that racism by making them feel like it's a good thing, it's a beneficial thing. Come join us. We understand you. We get you. You know, we think you're right and the rest of society is wrong. That's, you know, that's probably one of the biggest um, with cults. They prey upon people that they know are empathic and compassionate and suggestible. It's almost like they can smell them out. Um, the Stockholm Syndrome, again, using that sort of intermittent reinforcement to get your victim to start aligning with you as the abuser or as the captor. Oh, gosh. Using ritual sexual abuse on children is one of the best ways that you can get them to become whatever you want them to be. And it's just such a terrifying and tragic part of the MK Ultra. It comes in... You know, part of our history. It, oh, gosh. Yeah. Hypnosis along with drugs, hypnosis along with sensory deprivation. There's just so many, you know, starvation, microwave exposure, radiation exposure, actually uh, the use of pornography. There are so many many different ways the, the to break down endless. someone's mind and rebuild it to your own desires that it's just I mean you really can't go down that rabbit hole it's a, and it's a deep dark one to go down if you really want it to. is yeah and it was really hard doing some of the research and writing it you know and just trying uh -huh. to realize okay we need to expose this because really the more people that know about this I think awareness and education can help people look for those red flags, even in their interpersonal relationships, um, but certainly when they're dealing with religious institutions, politicians, you know, doctors, psychiatrists, I mean, abusers are everywhere. I don't know how you do it because you talk a lot about, uh, on all your books, a lot of a variety of topics, much of which are, are really hard to, to chew on and to research, so I imagine it, it must take a quite a bit of an emotional toll each time you write a book, particularly with, with topics of, of, of this breath. You know, it's really strange. I mean, I, you know, Larry's a, a pretty positive person. I'm a really upbeat, goofy, positive person. And I think that that, that is something that is not going to change no matter how much of this I'm aware of. Um, you have to detach a little bit from it, obviously, and I just feel like it's important enough to, to slog through it and expose it, and I think when you expose this stuff, you take away some of its power right there, so any book, whether it's mine or anybody else's or any radio show, whether it's yours or anybody else's, anytime we expose this stuff more, we're disempowering it. Um, and so those are the things that I hang on to. If I'm writing about something scary like the paranormal or, you know, super volcano, something that <laughs> could lead to uh, uh, just, you know, such a huge catastrophe or this, which is really frightening because to me the most terrifying things in life are the things that we humans do to each other. Um, I don't think I could write this kind of stuff if I were a really depressed, downbeat person to begin with. And I just see the importance of getting it out there. And that sort of overrides all of this stuff. That it's like, oh, man, you know, this is going to hurt for a few months hmm. learning some of this stuff. And, and, I, appreciate shining, yeah. and I appreciate shining a light on it because, uh, you know, for those who, who don't know about this, it really is great to... to think in a whole new perspective because that's what you're doing you're almost like mind control you're, you're changing my perspective in a sense to, to to what you're trying to tell me to think 
to, to see. And and those for those for just joining us, we're here with Marie D. Jones discussing her latest book, Mind Wars, uh, the history essentially of mind control and brainwashing. And, and Marie, it's really timely that you're actually here right now with the Scientology doc, but also the, the sad anniversary of uh, RFK's death. And uh, attorneys for of his uh, of his killer, Saran Saran, obviously the man who assassinated him, it's alleged that he was actually part of this Project MK Ultra, or at least he was being brainwashed uh, and, and essentially a, a patsy for the RFK assassination. Yeah, what, and that, you know, what did you yeah, find that? that is just, uh, I'll just kind of summarize that there's not a whole lot of information out there except for the fact that Sirhan has, Sir has consistently claimed that he didn't remember, that he had no idea of what, what he was doing and his current lawyer, um, Robert, uh, Roger, uh, William Pepper, a, I think William Pepper. Yeah, his current lawyer is still claiming that he was a part of MK Ultra. His uh, psychiatrist that looked at him, even you know, shortly after he was um, imprisoned at Dan Quentin, uh, a chief psychiatrist, David G. Smith, Edward Simmons, and Callis, there were a number of psychiatrists that looked at this man and determined that he was not. Psychotic. He was not a schizophrenic. He was not mentally ill. But he honestly seemed to have a sort of black spot about his memory of what was happening. And that a lot of his uh, drawing, little doodles and things that he was drawing, a lot of his behaviors and a lot of things that he was saying after he was imprisoned, sounded like he may have been under some kind of hypnosis, some kind of mind control. Now we know at the time. We know that part of MK Ultra obviously was going on in the 60s. It didn't stop until the mid-70s. But we know that one of the um, aspects of MK Ultra was to create assassins. And the way that you created an assassin is you took a human being, you broke down their identity, you, you just destroyed their identity, and you replaced it with what are called alters, new identities. And it's almost like Sybil, the movie about the woman with all the multiple personalities. Literally, that is what MJ Ultra was doing to some of these people, creating multiple personalities, one of which happened to be an assassin. These people were programmed with triggers and cues to go out, kill somebody, and then not remember it. Everything was, was with the use of hypnosis and the other types of mind control techniques, everything was programmed perfectly so that someone like Sir Hans, Sir Hans could go do something like this, literally forget about it the second he did it, and never remember since. Um, some MK Ultra victims that were programmed to be assassins were given a final cue to commit suicide, and you will read about a lot of them that did, that killed themselves, uh, that were associated with perhaps killing somebody, and then they themselves died under quote-unquote mysterious circumstances. Do we know for sure that Sir Hans Sir Hans didn't do this of his own volition? No, we don't, but it really is kind of sneaky and suspicious. Mm -hmm. And he was making these claims during the time when M.K. Ultra was probably at its height. You're an author, and you probably want to keep a journalistic perspective, so you don't want to say definitely yes or no what your opinion is. Uh, so I will. I, I it definitely reeks of Project MK Ultra, in my opinion. Uh, so it seems. And before you mention movies like Sybil uh, and then Manchurian Candidate, and one of my favorite all-time movies is Zoolander. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it at all. Have you ever seen Zoolander? Oh, it's, <laughs> I have, and I'm thinking, how the heck do you associate that? That's about the male model, right? What's his name? Right, uh, Zoolander. Uh, Zoolander, Zoolander, Derek Zoolander, yeah. and you know, he go, he's a male model through. Uh, he gets brainwashed in a long lineage of those, uh, essentially a, a mancher and candidate. I about that. And I, I love that movie. I think it's hilarious and, and all that stuff. But do you think movies like, obviously, take away Zoolander, but maybe more dramatic and serious movies like Mancher and Candidate and Symbol? Do you think this hinders or, or helps the connotation of uh, brainwashing and mind control? I think it helps if they're quality made. And that is so funny because I've seen Zoolander more than once and I completely forgot about that part of it. That is so <laughs> weird. But for example, I when we were writing the book, I had never seen Conspiracy Theory with Mel Gibson. And I somebody had told me, oh, it's about MKUltra. It's, it's fantastic. It's very 
honest in its portrayal of an MK Ultra survivor and just never had the chance to see it. And lo and behold, I was changing channels one day while I was writing and it was on, so I sat down and I watched it. That was a very, very powerful experience because I had just read some of the documentation that had been you know, uh, taken through the Freedom of Information Act and put out to the public. And, it, and then seeing the movie and watching how he literally was scrambling in his brain through the different altars that he was given and the PTSD that he was suffering from, from the, the trauma, it was amazing. And I think that there are, the Manchurian Candidate movies, there were two of them. I think they're brilliant. Um, I, I, you know, there are certainly movies that go to the extremes with the conspiracy theories, I'm not sure how much good or bad those do, <laughs> but I think any time the entertainment industry can put out something of quality that tells a truth we may not be ready to accept uh, when it's presented to us as news or fact, I think that's a good thing. I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, after reading your book, I'll, I'll never be able to look at Zoolander the same way. And I, I th- I'm going to have to watch it again. <laughs> uh, I think I'm, I'm, I have a late night funny. session of Zoolander coming in later tonight or tomorrow. No doubt about that. <laughs> uh, that is hilarious. I never, I never noticed that. <laughs> uh, I, I want to stick with uh, current events uh, and, and the government as well, kind of combine the two. And and before you said, we were talking about the Snowden revelations quickly, and, and it showed us that really the government is controlling information by invading our privacy. And, and you argue in the book that uh, that essentially is a form of mind control, and I, I couldn't agree more with you. So we can see that it does happen yeah. on an individual level, but I want to talk about it on a, on a mass societal level. Do you think that it, a, it happens really, that large-scale brainwashing happens, I believe you do, and, and do you think that we as Americans have been brainwashed as a society to give up our freedoms for so-called national security? Oh, absolutely. Oh my gosh, absolutely. I think it's been going on a long time, but I think right after 9-11, we literally handed over our civil liberties on a plate under the guise of fear, 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 hate your enemy. You know, hate the Muslims, hate the blacks, hate this, hate your, hate the righty, hate the lefty. It was such a pervasive theme that we're still experiencing today. Hate this group, hate, feel afraid of this group. Um, you know, that it is a wonderful, wonderful technique for keeping us distracted, for keeping us weak, for keeping us attacking each other while we ignore the fact that you know, our, our cell phones are spying on us and it was something that came out a couple of days ago about Google that had its eavesdropping tool installed on yeah. computers without permission. You know, we like pass over this stuff because we're too busy hating each other <laughs> and being afraid of each other, all the while giving up our rights. Absolutely. I, and I think that that is such a um, an insidious method of behaves to such a member mind control is also about behavior modification if you want to control somebody's mind why you want to change their behavior okay you, you don't just want to change their thoughts but that's meaningless you want to change their ultimate actions and behavior and one of the best ways to do that is to watch their every move study trends study what they're what gets them angry what gets them afraid and then use that to kind of prey upon the public through the media manipulation and you know Big Farm is a great example of this and you'll start to notice a pattern after a while of news stories that tell you oh my god the measles outbreak oh my god they have measles <laughs> we must have man- you know mandate forced vaccination which I think is one of the most fascist things I've ever heard of. Uh, unbelievably but unconstitutional. Right around that, yeah, right around that same time, there's a proliferation of big pharma ads on TV promoting their latest vaccines. Oh, hello, That's there's true. no relationship there. I'm aware of this, you're aware of this. The general public is not aware of these patterns, but, you know, we want them to be. That's why we're doing what we're doing. Hmm. So, we're under constant surveillance to keep us in line, but also to learn about what makes us tick. 
Is there a national security purpose? Absolutely. I believe that that's a part of it, but it's definitely morphed into something a little more about keeping the populace, keeping the status quo, keeping the populace under control, uh, and making sure that, you know, we all kind of do what we're supposed to do. Keep us in line. And yeah, like you said, our civil liberties. It seems like insane. more. Uh, it seems more like national insecurity these days than really national security because they they can't guarantee that and they know it and it's it's a bunch of BS in my opinion and uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you know this but on Friday it's uh, George I believe it's Friday maybe this weekend it's George Orwell's birthday or the celebration maybe a hundred and oh brother be. really uh, oh, that's yeah yeah so. <laughs> He, he, he must be rolling over oh in his gosh. grave right now. 1984, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, he, he's he's got to be rolling over in his here. grave. Yeah, Big Brother. And, it's, and Big Brother is not just the government. It's corporations that want to study your every behavior so they know what to sell you. Hmm. They know what, you know, to consume, consume, consume. And I sometimes believe that the influence of corporations on our behavior and our mind is more evil than what the government is up to. At least the government can say, yeah, you know, we are trying to protect you a little bit. Corporations want nothing more than to keep us buying whatever it is they're trying to sell us. And, and nowadays it's almost the, the same thing. I'm sure you heard about that study, I believe it was last year, maybe Yale or Princeton, one of the, you know, one of the big schools saying that essentially we now live in a, a form of uh, an oligarchy instead of a democratic republic, uh, which I couldn't agree more with. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And this is all happening, I like to say hidden in plain sight, but it really is in plain sight. And mm -hmm. the thing is, is that most people, at least in the United States, but I hear this from people I know all over the world, most people are so distracted by their technology, by the overwhelm, overflow of information that they have access to, that we tend to not know what to focus on and not know what's important anymore. That's another way that the media work to sneak the true stories that we really need to be getting enraged about. You know, right under the radar, because they've got our focus on who Taylor Swift is dating, <laughs> and they've got our focus on, you know, who the, the newest transgender person. Not that these aren't important stories to somebody, but, you know, the constant distraction of keeping us dumped down, keeping our, our focus elsewhere, they're able to get the truth right by us, whereas if we just sort of turn around a little bit, we can see it. It's right there. You just got to just gotta open your eyes. We just got to peek behind the curtain just for, for one moment. And the, the exactly. government... And the government almost kind of has a shield in the fact that with the way that they invade our security and our privacy saying that we're not collecting information on the individual we're just collecting anonymous information it's just data mining we don't know anything specifics but all over the internet the cable and on on television there are, there are people who are calling themselves ti's which obviously you're familiar with targeted individuals right. and they believe that, yeah. that they're the ones being surveyed uh, and being targeted. Talk a little bit more about that, and, and what are the things that their claim is happening specifically to them? Yeah, I wish Larry could have been on, because he works for Homeland Security, believe it or not. Huh. <laughs> and he does cyber security, and he understands everything about data mining, and it is absolutely fascinating that everything that we do is being logged somewhere. And like you said, yeah, there's so much information that chances are they're not going to focus in on you and I having this conversation right now, uh, unless certain keywords or key phrases are mentioned. But just the fact that we're still all being treated as potential terrorists, you know, that bothers me. But anyway, <laughs> I'm weighing into this. I, I, think this is, I think the truth is, is that we're all targeted individuals, but there are a very specific group of people um, who claim that they are being targeted with Different technologies, uh, non-lethal weapons, microwave harassment, something called voice to skull, which literally uses microwave pulses to uh, project sound into the, somebody's brain from a remote location. Well. And that they're being targeted for two different reasons. I talked to a lot of TIs who knew why. They were either whistleblowers or associated with the government or they had someone in their family that worked for the government or that was a whistleblower 
they knew. The vast majority of them, I think, of PIs have no clue why they're being targeted and feel like they're just really guinea pigs for the testing of all these new technologies, which literally amount to when, when you're a kid and you play with a little remote control car, that's what they're doing to us, okay? We're becoming remote controlled human beings and they're using sound, uh, sound waves, sonic weapons, microwaves, um, heat, you know, they're using all these different non-lethal techniques to do that. It's, it's the scary. last research that I did, I think there was, uh, somebody claimed on a website there were over 300,000 registered target individuals. So there are different websites um, where people who feel they're being covertly harassed, they can go and they can kind of register and join forums and exchange ideas. Uh, but it's, it's terrifying. I mean, some of the things that they claim are happening, you could say, oh, no, it's happening to everybody, but when you put them all together, it's really frightening. And I don't know if I have time to read some of them. Uh, if, if you got it, please, please do. you got plenty of time. Yeah, okay. So, for example, some of the... Uh, the harassment that TI are experiencing involved hallucinations, mysterious skin rashes, twitches, voices in the mind, or sounds of pulses or tones in the mind, um, extreme headaches, fatigue, pin prick sensations all over the body, burning sensations, something called brighting, where people turn their headlights on you, the cars, whenever you're out and out. Stalking or gang stalking, where you're literally being followed by groups of people, and you hear your name being discussed, you hear personal information that <laughs> these people should know being talked about. Street theater is another name for that. Uh, noise harassment, suddenly some a neighbor or your neighbors become really noisy uh, throughout the night. You know, you feel like you're being terrorized. Um, one thing that I, uh, I had a friend who experienced this is really frightening is having people breaking into your home or your garage but not taking anything. In other words, it's like a scare tactic. We can get into your home anytime, anytime we want, wow. um, but they don't necessarily see. It's just really meant to sort of psychologically impair these people. Um, vandalism, auto uh, accidents, uh, you know, that feel like they've been staged objects in their homes and their yards moved around. So those are some of the things these people are talking about. And the American government has, uh, has a long oh, history. I was going to say, and the American government has a long history of suppressing whistleblowers. And in my opinion, it seems you said mentioned that a lot of these are, are veterans. Veterans, to me, would be the perfect people to do this. Because who's going to believe a, a veteran? Oh, it's just PTSD. They're just going through something after the yeah, war. Yeah, they're crazy. Exactly. Sure, they're crazy. They're almost the perfect um, yeah. uh, ones to experiment, experiment on when it comes to this. Yeah, that, God, that makes me think, was, uh, there was a movie called Jacob's Ladder that I think was kind of similar to that. There have been a, a number of movies where somebody felt like they were, well, Gaslight is a classic movie from the 50s where a man drives his wife crazy using some of these techniques. And these are the same techniques now that are being used on, on people by the, their own government. So whether, now the question is whether some of these people are just misinterpreting things that are happening, um, and, and we don't know. But when you have a number of these things happening to you, you have somebody who's really sincere and not out seeking attention, or they can point to, or they have pictures, or they have evidence of certain things, or they know why they're being harassed. You really have to take this seriously and wonder, are we all guinea pigs for the new technologies that are being developed. And if we try to tell someone, is anybody going to believe us? And that's what they want. That's the exact type of perspective they want from everyone to, 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 to think that way. Well, we can't trust anybody what they say. And, and it's exactly. almost like, uh, you know, through their disinformation campaigns, it's like sometimes they'll give you, they'll just fill you with the lies, give you a seed of truth, and then just, and then they'll, or the vice versa, they'll have a lot of truth with the, you know, a little bit of a lie just to always give you that seed of doubt whether it could something be fact or fiction, and it almost seems like you can never know between the two anymore. And isn't that the same thing that's going on in the UFO field? with disclosure, with people trying to come forth and say, look, I was there at Roswell, or I saw this, 
oh, you're crazy. You know, I mean, I think that that applies to any field where you're trying to put forth information or claims that are thought of as conspiracy. You know, there's the general public just says, oh, that's, that's conspiracy theory. That's not real. It is real. And no doubt about that, you know, in 50 years from now, what documents are going to come out to tell about what's what's really going on now and what even further what happened back then? So it's really terrifying to think about because this subject, it has so many different tentacles and reaches into so many different facets of life, government, financial, uh, just a little bit of everything. It's really, really scary, particularly with the government. But uh, Marie, I just want to switch, and we're with Marie D. Jones talking about her book, uh, Mind Wars, and I just want to switch gears a little bit. We, we've talked a lot about the government, and I think people by now can pretty much clearly see that the government has a big hand in experimentation with mind control and brainwashing. I want to talk a little bit about the cult mentality of, of brainwashing, particularly because of the Scientology document that just came out going, going clear. Do you, mind using, right. do you mind using Scientology as an example to show how the cult mentality is developed through mind control, and, and also, I think there, that, and also, just give your thoughts on the on the documentary if you had a chance to see it too. I haven't seen it yet, but you know, I've been following not following them. <laughs> Everything that was in the documentary was in your book. Following their, their, them for years, yeah. I mean, Scientology is the perfect example of a religious cult. Religious cults are the most powerful because they not only play on. Uh, having a charismatic leader, but they play on ideology. They play on belief. Those are the most powerful cults that there are. Um, but basically, cults often involve either a, a charismatic leader around whom people are, are gravitate or are drawn, or an ideology, and sometimes both. In the case of the greatest cults that we know, Jim Jones and David Koresh, Manson, and even now Ron Hubbard in Scientology, they had both a charismatic leader and an ideology that attracted people in. And they tend to prey again on people who are very uh, very intelligent. One of the myths about cults is that stupid people join them. Not true. That is the farthest from the truth. Cult members are usually incredibly intelligent, but they're also Highly ideological, empathic, compassionate, sensitive, and a lot of times they they tend to be loners or they're people that are, you know, looking for an identity or looking for their, maybe going through an identity crisis of their own. These charismatic leaders know how to play on that. So they get you sucked in. They start to use all the different techniques we talked about earlier, positive, negative, intermittent reinforcement, capture bonding, Stockholm Syndrome, love bombing, and then, you know, introducing abuse, ritual. And it's that once you're in, it becomes so psychologically and sometimes even physically impossible to leave that you are literally their slave. They, they, you know, they isolate you from your family and friends so that your perception of reality becomes what they want it to be. You don't get that outside perception anymore. Um, you know, they demand outright loyalty to their leaders. They demand loyalty to their belief system, no matter how crazy it might be. Uh, sometimes they use things like deprivation and isolation to punish you if you dare express an alternate thought or, or idea. And they're very, you know, I mean, it's very difficult to get out of a cult, just as it's very difficult to get out of a domestic violence situation because of how they work on the brain. For those that survive cults and, and abuse, like, like what you're just talking about, their, their lives are hell. And I actually know a person, he's really a, a friend of a friend, of mine, and he was actually a child survivor of ritual abuse at the hands of really his own family. And, uh, and the, nowadays, yeah, yeah. You know, he's really he interacts minimally with human beings. He, uh, he or she, they they work at a pet store. You know, they essentially pets are, are their only friends, and really seems like they're a shell of themselves. So, you know, when you oh, you know for the for the listener, you just got to put yourself in that perspective. You, Put your, yourself in another shoes because these things are real and it and it really happens and I'm sure you going through your research you've come through that time and time again these type of things that have happened on and on and over and over. 
what really shocked me, and, and again, Larry, you know, he's in, in a in law enforcement setting, and he was in the FBI, and, you know, I had outright asked him, I said, are there a lot of cults out there? And he, you know, really, when you do the research, you find that there are a lot of these cults on a smaller scale in every state of this country that you don't hear about. You only hear about the ones that make the news because of a mass suicide or a mass murder. Um, and it's just really scary. And, you know, a couple of the people that we interviewed, one of them was a friend of mine that I didn't even know had been involved in, a, in when she was growing up in a religious cult a Christian fundamentalist cult, and it's just everywhere. And, it, it, and when family members are involved and they're abusing you and they're part of the cult, it, you want to stay where they are and you'll put up with so much damaging behavior, but you don't want to break away. I think that's one of the worst situations that you can be in. Um, but, you know, I mean, they play on this idea of come and join our family, and that is a phrase that you will hear over and over again in any cult, come be a part of our family, you're wanted here, you're one of us, you've found your tribe, your people, and to somebody who doesn't have a strong identity or feels like a loner or feels rejected by society, that is very powerful stuff. There seems to be a lot of comparisons, or at least that's the way I look at it, that, that cults, there's a lot of comparisons uh, between cults and the Nazi movement. It seems like there's there's just so many parallels between the two. I think that was one of the biggest cults of all time, <laughs> with not only one of the most charismatic leaders who ever lived, I hate to say that, but that's, he was, well, that's the truth. but also one of the most powerful ideologies of uniqueness and specialness and wanting to cleanse the earth of the dirt and the scum. Wow, you play on people's identities big time. Yeah, who, who doesn't want exactly that? What <laughs> I, I want that, you know. I'm Jewish and I want to rid the, the world of scum and it, all that yeah, stuff. So it, know, everybody can, you everybody can, can follow You've got a bunch of people that are poor and they're, they're, you know, looking for anything that can make them feel better about their own damned condition. And he, Hitler was a master of rhetoric, a master of language, and that's something that we see with cult leaders, is that the ones that have mastered the use of language, Jim Jones, oh my gosh, uh, we included part of his final speech before they all killed themselves, they knew how to say just the right thing to hook you in. They, they just knew. I mean, I don't think it was something that they went and studied necessarily. I don't know if it just was inherent to them or genetic or whatever, but these are just incredibly psychopathic, narcissistic individuals that knew how to say and do the exact right thing to hook their members in and keep them there. And speaking of uh, narcissists, the Westboro Baptist Church... Uh, to me, they obviously they're a bunch of a holes in my opinion. But to me, they almost seem like a cult in 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 some respect. What do you think about that? I think yeah, and I think that they're more a cult of ideology because I can't remember the name of their head person. Yeah, I have no But their no clue. ideology is you know extreme fundamental to the fundamentals and to the point of it being it doesn't even have any basis on any doctrine at all. But yeah, definitely an ideological cult based on we are so perfect and special and the rest of you are all going to burn in hell. And that is their identity. And boy, they will hang on to that even in the face of facts showing otherwise. You know, even when people point out to them how cruel and vile and unchristlike they're being, <laughs> <laughs> they still, it's insane. And it just goes to show you how you can literally shut down somebody's thinking, rational brain and replace it with this fervor uh, if you know what to do. Uh, I, I hope they choke on their hypocrisy. That's just me. But uh... Uh, you know, I hope and pray that karma, whether it happens now or in the afterlife, they, they just... I sometimes feel sympathy for some of the members because I feel like, do they really know what they're doing? Uh, I mean, are they really into this, or are they just totally brainwashed? But you know, again, there are people that get out of those 
of those situations. So there is the possibility of self-awareness and waking up and saying, oh my God, what am I doing? You know, I gotta get out of this group. I gotta get out of this cult. I have to get out of this religion. And I know people that have escaped very fundamentalist, very cult-like churches. And it was, it was hard. Uh, it was actually terrifying to have one friend who said everybody in her neighborhood shunned her and her family. But he said, I wonder, are they even in control of their own minds anymore at that point? What about deprogramming? People can, you know, like they can be programmed, they can obviously then take away that cult mentality or, or that brainwashing. How, how does that work? You know, it's just a reversal of the same way that their identities were destroyed and rebuilt. I think deprogramming got such a bad name back in the 70s and 80s. There, was, there were a lot of um, cases where families were working with energy programmers and literally kidnapping cult members and you know there, there's a big fuss about oh their private rights they can be in the cult if they want but deprogramming works and what it does is it literally takes apart what the cult programmed and tries to bring back your original identity or at least leave your mind open enough to to create a new more positive empowering identity it takes a long time and it, I don't know that it always works it's amazing to think about how susceptible the mind is to, to mind control. You can put things in, you can take things out. It's terrifying to think about how much or how little control you almost have over your brain in, in certain respects. And uh, Yeah, when you're not paying attention, you know, it's like, do, you, do, do most people think about what they think about? And I think, again, most of us are so busy, distracted, and on the go and overwhelmed with information and things to do that we don't always pay attention to what we are absorbing into our minds. And then, uh, I don't watch TV at all, but I feel like the TV um, uh, TV is almost a, a form or an institution for brainwashing, and, and subliminally, that's, I think, how they get you, because of you're not distracting, and then also combined with the subliminal aspect to it. And uh, We've talked a lot about the past and, and the and the present of mind control, what does the future hold for it? I think in terms of the future, it's going to be more surveillance-based. Um, I think that the control aspect is, is, rather than, you know, develop some kind of weird death ray where you literally turn your entire populace into zombies, I think that the idea is more surveillance, more eavesdropping, more spying, more data mining and using that information more to determine who gets food, who gets water, um, you know, who gets to go to the best school, who gets this deal, who gets that deal. I think we're going to start seeing some of those things happening. Uh, as the corporations like Big Pharma, Big Agriculture become more powerful, and they always have been, I think they're becoming even more powerful. The media is going to be more and more controlled by um, whoever's paying the bill, and you're going to see a lot more push for, you know, fear-based things like forced vaccines, or, oh my God, the depression rates are skyrocketing, or this new cancer is skyrocketing, you've got to take this drug. You're going to see a lot more of that. Really, I think that if we are aware, we can kind of rein in technology and make it work a little bit better for us. I see a lot of people that use their gadgets and don't even give a second thought to the fact that you've got, you know, your phone can track for every step. Mm -hmm. If somebody really wanted to know everywhere you've gone today, they, they can figure that out if they have the access. I think we've got to educate people just, you know, how much they're under surveillance how much mind control goes on, all the different ways that it comes to you, whether it's the media, your, you know, religion, politicians, advertisers, you name it. Um, or it's going to get to the point where we really are going to be slimmed. We really are going to be numbed and dumbed to the point where they can make us do anything they want. They can make us buy anything, consume anything, and behave in any way that they want because we've bought into being slaves.
we never woke up, we never got aware, we were too distracted, too busy, too overwhelmed, what have you. Marie, you just gave us two different scenarios for the future. Uh, in, look into your crystal ball. In your opinion, what, what do you see that's going to happen? Which way is it going to go? Is it going to be for the positive or is it going to be for the negative? Is it only going to get worse? I think it's going to be both. You know, my, my feeling is history repeats itself because human nature doesn't change. So what I see happening is I see things getting a lot worse. And I see people getting a lot angrier. And I see people coming together. There already are large groups mobilizing, you know, to fight against this stuff. And I see that happening. So I see the negative, and then I see the positive coming in and kind of saying, oh, no, <laughs> step back a little, you know, getting things under control a little. But we have to be really careful that we don't let up too much because human nature is always going to be human nature. And when we let up, when we let up on controlling our own minds and our own lives, we open the door again for somebody else to come in and control them. So I see both. I see the negative. I see an increase in surveillance, an increase in non-lethal weaponry being used in riots and protests against the police, what have you. But I see more and more protests on behalf of the civilians and the citizens saying, this has got to stop. Enough is enough. Sadly, I'm, I'm right there with you, but I do think that there is some light at the end of the tunnel, and eventually we will get to that point, but unfortunately it's going to be a while until we get there, and people by now probably are pretty horrified and, and even probably depressed after listening to what we've been talking about and really seeing I, that. You know, I <laughs> hope not. I, I, true, true. Be empowered. I mean, I'm not depressed. I'm mad. I'm not, don't be depressed. Be mad. <laughs> I'm, mad as, I'm not going to take anger will motivate you forward. Depression will just keep you stuck. Uh, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. But but now they there can, you go. <laughs> but but now people can really see how pervasive my control and brainwashing is in our society. And I don't really want to sound all gloom and doom for the show. So uh, and like we said before. My control is a spectrum, so there has to be some positive there uh, on there. Is there any positive aspects to my control and brainwashing? Absolutely. When my control becomes one of the most empowering things ever is when you use it on yourself. When you stay in control of your thoughts, when you stay in control of your behaviors, when you use some of the techniques like hypnosis, brain entrainment, binaural beats, meditation would have you to control what's in your mind you can really empower your life you can quit smoking you can lose weight you can overcome phobias you can become more successful you can become more uh you know less introverted what have you so controlling our own minds and our own behaviors and actions you know that's self-mastery the problem occurs when we try to control others or others try to control us. But definitely there's a lot of positive stuff to this. When you're doing it to empower and make your own life better. And I can attest to that, Marie. I have always suffered from anxiety and depression throughout my whole life. And recently, within the past couple of years, I've been using a combination therapy where uh, meditation plus a sound of healing, binaural beats, alpha waves, uh, and that really seems to have helped. And, and I really do think that does fall under the f umbrella of my control, but it can be positive, like you said. But in a good way, it. absolutely. And sure, because you don't want your thoughts running rampant. You know, you want to try to get them organized and, and proactive and getting you towards a certain goal that's really going to help you have a better life. So, yes, we do want to control our minds. We just don't want other people controlling them. Mm, preach it. Preach it. Uh, I'll listen to you say that all over and over again. And, uh, we're, we're, we're running out of time here. We're running out of moonlight. And uh, I like to end each show by giving our listeners some strategies uh, of action. Uh, Marie, what are, what are some ways people and our listeners can protect themselves from these types of invasion of privacy and mind control? You know, just a little bit. I mean, read my book or just do some <laughs> research on there aren't a whole lot of things you can do to really protect your information, but there are some. You know, when you're on the Internet, be aware of what you're saying and what you're putting out there. When you're on your cell phones, turn off your location tracker. Look at the privacy devices or apps that are on there. Not going to completely get rid of the problem, but it sure will make it more difficult. 
um, you know, you're not going to be able to avoid satellites and drones looking through your windows, but there are little things that we can do, and I think one of the most, the biggest ones is getting educated, and if it makes you mad enough, join an organization, join an organization that is uh, fighting against the invasion of privacy rights, or trying to protect our civil liberties, there's a bunch of them out there, um, and, you know, making your voice heard, letting your political representatives know that this is not acceptable, and just be a little more aware of when you do things online and on your cell phone that you are locked in to the Internet, which is open for all eyes to see. And I think just awareness and education can give people ideas of ways that they can curb their own behavior or change it. And the easiest way to start is to is to eat some is to read some information and and I definitely highly recommend your book Mind Wars. It, I really enjoyed it. It's a a quick read and, and really some great uh, wonderful research. And uh, before I let you go, I just want to know you've written God knows how many books at this point, and it seems like you're always coming out with a book every six months. I don't know. It's just, to me, it always seems like it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm sure you're coming out with a book, uh, another one next week. What what can we expect from the next one? Are, are you working on anything, or are you can enjoy your summer break? Yeah, I, I've actually got some novels that will be coming out. I'm getting back a little bit into fiction, but for nonfiction next uh, early next year, I'm not sure which month, but um, we'll be doing a book called Bug, Hunting the World smallest terrorists, and it's about the uh, emergence and re-emergence of infectious diseases, viruses, Ebola, you know, all of that, and, and the controversies and conspiracies surrounding them as well. Because if you think about it, the smallest terrorists in the world are probably the dead, most deadliest, and again, it's a scary subject, but I think it's one that is worth, you know, people getting educated on. You, you keep shining a light on all these uh, hidden crevices of our lives, and I'll keep having you on. You always have an open door here at the Mind's Eye. Fantastic job, as always, Marie. Thank you so much for joining me tonight on the Mind's Eye. Thank you, sir. I will definitely be back. Thank you. Yes, it's something I didn't know about at all until it was kind of discovered by his defense team, and then they began to question our mother about it. MK Ultra program was actually a CIA covert operation within the United States where unwitting um, suspects um, were made guinea pigs in research um, about psychotropic drugs, um, various kinds of um, psychological pressure. I think there's pretty clear evidence that MKUltra was a program at Harvard. Um, Ted was in a psychological research study um, run by a An interesting possible connection is that Murray had actually been in the OS, um, OS, OSS. OSS, that's right, which was the forerunner of the CIA during World War II, and the projects he did had to do with debrief, debriefing prisoners of war. So we wonder if, you know, maybe he used some of the same tactics in, in sort of probing and poking. Um, young, unwitting college student.
Congress destroyed many of the records of that program. And of course, big thanks to Marie D. Jones for enlightening us on this fascinating and horrific topic. For more information on Marie, go to our website, themindseyemedia.com. Again, themindseyemedia.com. You can also go to our social media page. Our Twitter handle is at Minds Eye Show. Again, at Minds Eye Show. And our Facebook is facebook.com backslash Minds Eye Show. Over the next couple months, you'll notice that the Minds Eye Show will be dark. Like you, I need a bit of a summer break, and I will be actually focusing on some other projects, which I'll be more than happy to tell you about. But in the meantime, if you still need some information to chew on, don't worry, I'll still be updating the social media pages every single day, multiple times a day, with all the goodies that you've come to expect. But you have to keep checking back at the Mind's Eye site. Again, that's the mindseyemedia.com. But more importantly, you want to know what can you expect for the second half of our second season in the back end of 2015. Starting... even expect to hear a debate with myself and a New York City police officer who's on the streets every day protecting us and he's a bit more controversial and liberal minded than most cops so it's going to be a great show. You can expect those when we come back. I can't wait but unfortunately we're going to have to wait a little bit because Papa needs a little summer break too. I hope you enjoy your summer as well. Until the next one, this has been your host Brian Turnoff signing off for the Mind's Eye. Until the next one.